organizers for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'll be describing a line of works uh, done in collaboration with... Not working. Hello? Okay. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, done in collaboration with uh, Amnon Shashua, Nadav Cohen, Or Sharir, and uh, David Yakira, where the first two works are uh, oriented towards the deep learning community, uh, providing some result in the emerging field of uh, deep learning theory. And uh, the most recent edition uh, has uh, work that works that can be uh, results that could be of interest to the many body quantum physics community. Now, as a starting point or a motivation, uh, I want to point out that though these are two distinct scientific disciplines, they share a common need for what we call many object expressiveness. So for example, in the deep learning uh, domain, uh, we see the, the, this image of a cat is comprised of many pixels, black and white. And the deep learning algorithm needs to somehow uh, model convoluted dependencies between these pixels and tell us that this is a cat and not a dog, for example. And similarly, in sequential tasks, uh, such as predicting the, the next word in a sentence, uh, the recurrent network or the deep learning architecture needs to be able to integrate uh, the words that it saw up until now and somehow predict that, okay? Uh, in the physics domain, we're more familiar with uh, quantum wave functions encapsulate uh, possibly very complex and convoluted dependencies between uh, many quantum particles. And uh, in the analogies that I will be speaking about today, we, uh, we say that pixels will be analogous to particles. It's going to be formal. It's going to come out of the math. And that will suggest uh, well-defined means of quantifying uh, quantum, uh, quantum entanglement as, uh, uh, as, a, as a means for quantifying the dependencies modeled by deep learning architectures with respect to their inputs. Okay, so we'll see that, how that will come about. And obviously the tools are different in both domains. We have convnets that operate well over images and RNNs, recurrent neural networks that deal well with uh, sequential tasks uh, such as speech recognition, machine translation, and more. And in the physics side, uh, a prominent uh, uh, scheme to classically simulate quantum systems is tensor networks, more recently uh, also RBM-based methods, uh, neural network-based methods. But uh, right now, our, our approach is this, just to say that these realize multivariate functions that can capture the dependencies required for each respective domain. Okay, So in the machine learning side, it needs to somehow answer machine learning questions. And in the physics side, it needs to somehow capture uh, highly entangled uh, systems of interest. Um, in our analysis, we rely on strengths in both domains and try to address the weaknesses. And broadly speaking, the strength in the deep learning uh, side, which we rely on, is the, the, just the empirical achievements uh, over the past five, six, seven, eight years. Are really astounding. Uh, just this uh, task of image classification was not so easy only a decade ago. And what we try to address is the formal understanding of why these architectures, uh, how they're constructed, uh, why, why, why are they so successful on natural data sets and uh, what stands behind the, this uh, great empirical success? Um, and in physics, uh, again, broadly speaking, decades of theoretical development, uh, tensor networks have been around for a decade and a half, and more fundamentally, uh, investigating quantum entanglement measures uh, of many object system uh, is, is, is well studied. Um, but the gap is we're still looking for uh, computational schemes that can efficiently uh, model a highly, com very complicated systems um, and, and also train, you know, also be trainable. Um, so relying, we will rely on uh, concepts and tools uh, from theoretical physics to try to address some of the open questions in uh, deep learning theory, uh, how to design a network for w when we have uh, specific uh, input correlations and more. And we will show that uh, the, these very powerful architectures that have really led the way in AI in the past few years uh, can model uh, highly entangled systems in two and three dimensions and also in uh, one dimension uh, polynomially more efficiently than currently employed schemes, which, uh, in which we would like to offer a motivation, a formal motivation, to shift this trend of uh, neural network-based wave function as us to more uh, prevalent uh, deep learning architectures such as convolutional networks and recurrent uh, networks. So I'll gradu uh, the outline is I'll gr gradually construct our, uh, our analogies in the, f in the first half, and then I'll discuss two uh, results uh, of interest to the machine learning community. And finally, I'll get to uh, uh, a recent result regarding uh, entanglement in deep learning architectures. So we will discuss convolutional networks um, that intake, for example, an image with n pixels. Uh, perform uh, L hidden layer, uh, L operations uh, subsequently, and then 
and then uh, output, for example, class score. Is this more likely to be an image of a cat or a dog? Um, we analyze a convolutional arithmetic circuit in which uh, nonlinearity is boiled down to polynomials, which will help us uh, analyze it theoretically, but is also uh, employed in practice and uh, shows good results. And because of, uh, because of the arithmetic nature, we're able to uh, summarize and write down the function realized by this convolutional network as an inner product between two tensors, uh, order n tensors, where the convolutional weights tensor really uh, holds the convolutional weights inside its entries and has to do with the network computation. And we have a rank one tensor that has to do with the n inputs to the network. The n pixels are, you just take an outer product of the n vectors, so you get a rank one tensor. Uh, and the overall computation by the network is this inner product between two tensors. Um, similarly, we analyze the recurrent network. Uh, so recurrent network integrates uh, incoming data with, uh, with a hidden state that sort of summarizes what the network has seen so far. And uh, so, for example, words in a sentence, and we try to predict what's the most probable world to be the next one. And again, the nonlinearity is a multiplication, which allows us to write the function realized by this recurrent network as, again, an inner product between two tensors, where now we have the recurrent weights tensor. We'll talk about its structure a bit later, but it holds all the information regarding the network computation, and it has to do with the recurrent weights of the network. And again, a rank one tensor that, uh, that's related to the inputs to the network, and it's rank one because you just take an outer product. So any physicist looking at uh, order n tensors with n indices can try and think, what, what happens if I just define a handcrafted wave function, call it psi convolutional, psi recurrent, and a product state because uh, you stick a rank one tensor uh, in the middle here with some, uh, some base to the, or to the Hilbert space, and you get a product state. So we can write down this inner product between two tensors just as uh, an inner product between two uh, wave functions and exactly reproduce what this, these convolutional or recurrent networks compute, which is nice to see that you can just uh, look at it at, from a different angle. And from here is what I promised, the pixels and the particles analogy, because we had n pixels to our network. Now this n index tensor uh, represents an n particle wave function, psi convolutional or psi recurrent. And again, all of the information regarding network computation is will be encapsulated in this uh, a convolutional or recurrent and not uh, the rank one tensor because it doesn't, uh, it's, it's just related to the inputs. So having constructed this analogy, we can try and argue what, what, what does, what, what's the implication or what does it mean, the entanglement structure of this psi convolutional or psi recurrent? It's not, I mean, it's, it's not really important in this. But we can. Okay, so uh, I want to get to uh, entanglement measures and how they sort of quantify dependencies uh, in these networks, but touch upon uh, a relevant uh, measure of, uh, of correlations modeled by deep learning architectures that was suggested uh, and analyzed in the deep learning literature. Uh, it's called a separation rank. And you ask how far the function realized by the network is from being completely separable with respect to some partition of its input. So you partition the pixels to, for example, left and right. And you ask if my function is completely separable, uh, it means it could be written as a multiplication of a function over A times a function over B. It means you can't really model any consistency. It's, 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 uh, it's very restricted. And the higher this measure of separation rank, the more consistency and the more elaborate correlations can be modeled between two sides of the image. And what we show is that this previously proposed measure is exactly equal to, the, to an entanglement measure of the, uh, the quantum state that we just uh, constructed. Um, it, it makes sense, but further on we can, okay, so the analogy, so we say that if, if psi is completely separable with respect to this partition, then the function realized by the network is completely separable, and the higher the separation rank, the more entangled our surrogate psi will be. And uh, this brings forth entanglement measures uh, of this uh, constructed state as quantifiers of dependencies modeled by our deep networks. And, even, and, and we know entanglement measures that are more uh, sensitive than the rank measure, such as uh, entanglement entropy, that are more sensitive to the amplitudes of, uh, of the singular values, so we can actually refine uh, previously uh, proposed uh, measures. And now, uh, interestingly, comes forth a design principle for deep convolutional networks once I have a given uh, data set. So, for example, imagine I have symmetric face images. That's my data set. If my uh, convolutional network is so limited that it cannot even model 
it, it, it has a very low rank with respect to this left-right partition, it means the hypothesis space is limited and we won't perform well on images, okay? So a design principle would be to have high entanglement with respect to this left-right partition. Otherwise, obviously, you wouldn't be able to model consistencies between my left and right side of, of my face, which are obviously dependent. Similarly, for natural data, this interleaved partition sort of tears apart uh, correlated, uh, correlated regions in the image. Close, close uh, regions are correlated in natural data. So our networks have better be able to, to model high entanglement with respect to these partition. I'm not yet saying how, but I'm just saying this is something that we would like to achieve uh, from this point of view. And for recurrent networks, an interesting, the partition of interest is a bit different. Um, w if we look at the start and partition, where the first half of the inputs and the last half of the inputs are in A and B, um, we notice that this is a really a surrogate for the long-term memory capacity of recurrent neural networks, which is obviously a desirable trait to be able to integrate uh, words from the beginning of the sentence when I predict the next word. So in this example, we have uh, the white Siamese cat slept on the, and if, if, if the network, if the network uh, doesn't have the ability to remember or to integrate uh, a convoluted function with A and B together, it will probably predict bed because it sees only uh, the, 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 the last few words. Okay, so, and we'd like our RNN to have a long-term memory to be able to translate well, to be able to predict well, et cetera, okay? So these, after like borrowing the, 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 the concept of entanglement, we, we can also lend practical tools from the many-body quantum physics community. And once I talk about wave functions, it's interesting to see how this, these tensors are decomposed in terms of tensor networks. Um, so it turns out to be this sort of tree where if I have uh, L uh, layers in my deep neural network, then uh, the, the depth of the tree is L. And in tensor network language, uh, a, a node with two uh, edges is uh, a matrix. And in this analogy, the thing to point out is that uh, deep learning practitioners have a degree of freedom when, uh, when designing a deep neural network. They can choose how many parameters to alloc allocate per layer. This is R0 to RL is the amount of parameters they allocate. And in the corresponding uh, tensor network picture, this uh, corresponds to the bond dimensions of the tensor networks, which are essentially, uh, if, if you view a tensor network as a weighted graph, so the weights of the edges exactly correspond to this this practical question of how many parameters do I allocate per layer, okay? Similarly, we construct uh, an, a matrix product state tensor network, which corresponds to our RNN, and I think uh, it has to do with the tensor train, uh, the tensor train Anima was talking about in the previous lecture. Um, and here also, the, the bond dimension of the MPS is the amount of parameters I choose to invest in the, in the RNN, okay? So after this, uh, this uh, construction, we, we can show some results attained. So the first one, uh, in the first one, we rely on a theorem from two, about two years ago that uh, quantifies the connection between a general tensor network and its graph to the amount of entanglement that it's able to, uh, to represent. Okay, and we, we apply it to our tensor networks of interest, which represent uh, deep learning architectures. And we show that uh, essentially the amount of entanglement that our uh, that our network uh, can represent has to do with a minimal cut in the tensor network graph. So our question of how do I control the entanglement if I have a specific, the face images, if I, have, if I want to give a high entanglement to the left-right partition, the, the formal mathematical answer is that I need to make sure that the minimal cut in the corresponding tensor network graph does not have, uh, does not have is not too low. Okay, it's some sort of an upper bound on, on how much entanglement my, my network can model. So it's, uh, it's preferable that I invest a lot of parameters in deeper layers, like in the example on the right. And in natural images, we see that the interleaved partition that has to do with short range correlations, uh, shallower layers are more important. So we have this sort of interesting uh, corollary that says that deep layers are more important for long range correlations and shallower uh, layers are more important for short range uh, correlations. And this, is, uh, this comes out of our, uh, of our uh, quantum physics based result. And we test this empirically and we show that indeed when, when examining a task that has long range dependencies and applying a network that has more uh, parameters in, in uh, deeper layers, the blue, ne the blue network has more parameters in deeper layers, it, perform it performs better on a task where we blew up MNIST digits. And when we shrunk MNIST digits where you need local uh, correlations, more short range correlations, uh, a network with uh, more parameters in shallower layers outperformed the network with deeper correlations. Yes? Right. So it sort of makes sense that after, you know, long L layers, you can lump together all the information. Right. It doesn't express anything at this scale, right? So it sounds like it seems like it's more a corollary of the type of architecture than the fact about. 
it's it's not really a fact about entanglement. It's really using the this uh, point of view, but it, it's really it makes a lot of sense. Okay, it, the, the fact that the deeper down you go, you you integrate farther away, uh, you, you integrate farther away. But that but that's uh, it's a corollary of the convolutional network architecture. That you see that once the receptive field sort of uh, covers the entire input domain, then you've essentially uh, mixed together distant uh, inputs, and you're able to uh, correlate them. Yeah, it's a it's a good uh, it's a good intuition, and what we've shown here is that we're able to use these uh, the design principles and tailor the architecture to the given task. Whereas a, a lot of times in deep learning, you just take off the shelf networks and throw them at problems. Your ability to pre-think and and ask yourself what's what are the dominant correlations in my data set are important. And open questions here are we we uh, like ha we hand tailor these tasks to be this is long range and this is short range, but in natural data sets, what are the predominant correlations and the according, uh, the according architectural uh, ad adoptions? Uh, moving on, um, a result about recurrent networks that was uh, attained. Again, uh, re reminding that the start and entanglement where we uh, have the first and last halves of the, of the sequence uh, is a good surrogate for the long-term memory of the RNN. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, the corresponding tensor network to the RNN is in a matrix product state. And a matrix product state, if I want to uh, cut between the first half and last half, I trivially just cut the bond dimension. So if I want a uh, more long-term memory, I just need to invest more parameters, and the long-term memory will increase linearly. However, uh, deep learning practitioners have a good idea uh, of how to use deep recurrent networks. Usually, uh, these, way, uh, these out outperform uh, shallow recurrent networks to, to, to receive state-of-the-art results, where essentially you just linearly increase the number of parameters in your network but you dramatically boost the performance. And what we do is we construct a tensor network analog of deep recurrent networks, and I'll, I'll skip through it to the results. We attain a lower bound on deep recurrent networks, which is super polynomially higher than the upper bound on shallow recurrent networks. And this is really a first of its kind result that show a theoretical assertion of, of depth, of what depth does to the long-term memory capacity of recurrent networks, explaining their, uh, effectively explaining their empirical uh, their empirical uh, superiority over shallow recurrent networks, and, and this is a fact that was not, was not shown theoretically. And also with depth, we've shown that uh, the, yeah, so uh, I, uh, the start end entanglement that we uh, previously defined, we see the, the white Siamese cat example, where you need to be able to integrate, uh, integrate things from the beginning of the sentence, or the beginning of your input, your ability to integrate the start and end of your input sequence is, uh, is our uh, definition of long-term memory. And th that is, in fact, what we show to be bounded from below in deep networks by, uh, by an almost exponentially large expression. Um, finally, uh, getting to uh, results we attained from, our, from this description, this tensor network-based uh, description to the many-body physics community. So the partition of interest here, as we know, is uh, taking uh, a small subsystem, A, and B is the rest of the world, and asking how the entanglement scales as I increase this system. If it scales like the volume of the subsystem in D dimensions, then you call it volume law, and if it uh, scales like the surface in D dimensions, it's area law, and a lot of states of interest uh, actually have area law entanglement, and anywhere in between area law and volume law uh, is, is of interest, and we are in search for efficient schemes that are trainable, that can capture high entanglement. Um, the leading tool was tensor networks. More recently, obviously, uh, neural network-based uh, wave function ansatz were joined the, the effort, RBMs and uh, fully connected networks. And we wanted to ask a simple question. What is the entanglement that more, uh, co more common or more, uh, let, let's say, state-of-the-art in deep learning architectures can support? Can, do these have any advantage over RBMs? Can they support high entanglement? And when uh, looking at that, we noticed that Deep recurrent networks and overlapping convolutional networks, which are basically regular convnets used, um, they share uh, the same trait of uh, information reuse. So in a deep recurrent network, you take the current hidden state, and it serves as a hidden state for the next time step, but also as an input to the next layer up, because you, because you have a deep network. So this, you, you sort of do a copy-paste in the, in the computation, and you use the same state twice. Similarly, uh, overlapping convolutional networks means you have a, a window that uh, sort of slides across your activation maps, and the window is larger than one. This is the convolution kernel. So it means that 
uh, adjacent activations are, let's say that the same activation is sort of copied several times and used in several adjacent computations in the subsequent layer. And this is very easy to do in practice, but it turns out that if I want to write a tensor network equivalent of this operation, there's no copy paste in tensor networks. Uh, so that's uh, hard to do, and we circumvented this using a trick. We simply uh, uh, duplicated the inputs to the network uh, in order to see how the tensor network equivalents of these state-of-the-art deep learning architectures look like. And we got these uh, large convoluted looking expressions, but what's important here is that they're trees. And we know that they're very efficiently, uh, wave function amplitude computation would be very efficient here because we know that backprop and forward pass in a deep network is something uh, efficient and quick, unlike, uh, unlike competing approaches. So before uh, uh, revealing the results regarding the entanglement capacity supported by these deep learning architectures, uh, just, just the, the, the ability to, to examine the entanglement enhancing mechanism of overlapping convolutional networks um, we, we can, and writing them in terms of tensor networks, we have, a, an, we have an ability to compare what happened in physics and what happened in deep learning uh, unknowingly. So a uh, tree tensor network was used when you had logarithmic needs uh, in physics up until 2006, and then uh, Vidal proposed using disentanglers, which resulted in the Mera tensor networks, uh, Mera tensor network that is used, but it has loops. So uh, wave function amplitude computation is intractable, it doesn't scale. Whereas the machine learning enhanced the naive coarse graining decimation scheme of a tree by using uh, overlaps and by reusing data, which allowed it to receive very uh, strong results, but, but, still keeping, uh, but still keeping it tractable, okay? So uh, the results are that deep recurrent networks support uh, logarithmic corrections to uh, area law in 1D, which is comparable to MERA. Um, but it has efficient uh, wave function amplitude uh, sampling abilities that make it, uh, make it uh, let's say, uh, you, you can use stochastic sampling renormalization technique or, or anything that, that involves wave function amplitude uh, uh, calculations. And even stronger, overlapping convolutional network, we've shown them to be able to support volume law entanglement uh, uh, polynomially more efficiently than uh, RBM-based or fully connected uh, neural network-based representations. Which, which really means that uh, this is sort of a formal suggestion to try out these networks uh, in parallel to the RBM effort because there's no theory says that they're, they're strong. They're, uh, they support volume law in 2D and this is uh, really uh, state-of-the-art networks that stand in the forefront of an empirical advances in AI can grant us access to the future maybe in many body physics. So to conclude, uh, we... Uh, drawn uh, an analogy between wave functions and convolutional and recurrent networks. We then propose entanglement measures as uh, measures of dependencies modeled by deep network with respect to their inputs and uh, constructed tensor network equivalents of them uh, that allowed us to use uh, results on tensor network in order to uh, derive some, uh, some design principles uh, for convolutional network and also uh, a first of its kind theoretical assertion of the benefits of depth and deep recurrent networks. And finally, we showed that uh, state-of-the-art deep learning architectures can model highly entangled state. So there's no, no theory standing between using uh, convnets and RNNs uh, to model wave functions.